that support a certain faith and uh, that each and, certain, each and every faith would present. And we have in this in the Quran the saying which said, Qul, uh, it's a verse which said, Qul hatu burhanakum in kuntum sadiqin. Say the of your proof, your evidence, if you are saying the truth. Now that person have, has one of these two options. If that person uh, is certain, and certainty is a must, that Islam is a true religion, he might either declare his faith and try to, let's say, travel or try to find a way to deal with his parents or with his environment, or he can secretly, and I know many people who are like that, you see, in many countries, including Lebanon, he can secretly practice his religion to, if not say, maintain his safety and not to put his, son, his life into, into danger and not to go in clash with uh, society and Allah knows that. Okay, I hope that, uh, that answers your question. Another question? Hey, I just um, thanks for the uh, for the interesting lecture. You're welcome. Yeah, um, I just have one a tiny comment or question, and I would like it if you would let me reply after you answer because the real question is is the reply. Okay. So yeah. So the thing is, um, the Quran and the Bible are incompatible. Okay. So there's there's I mean specifically about the issue of crucifixion and those other issues, but we have this um, this historical evidence, this historical. Um, the evidence, or, or it is historically documented that Jesus was crucified, and uh, we have witnesses, etc. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to say that wh why would we have any? I mean, okay, so we have this this book who suddenly uh, claim, we don't know where it came from, and who suddenly claims that, that this is a historical fact, who who, who questions it, and who claims that uh, Jesus wasn't crucified and, and he wasn't resurrected. Okay. Um, why should I have? Why I mean, where's where's what supports that? Why should I have any reason to believe in that? Since it it's, it contradicts the the initial uh, scriptures. So I mean, we have witnesses. We have historical evidence. What, what does the Quran have? What, what do, I mean, it just says that 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 it wasn't just simply as that. But I mean, that contradicts all historical proof. Firstly, I would challenge the assumption that it is historical evidence. I mean, the only evidence that you can refer to is the evidence within the Bible. But then we can reconcile that with the Quran because we can argue that the Bible has been subject to change, which is objectively verifiable. You don't have to be a Muslim to believe that. Um, was that the answer that you anticipated? Yeah. You may even not have it. Yes. Okay. Uh, have you ever heard of the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls? Have you ever heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls? Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, okay. Um, I'm, not, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna explain what those are. There were scriptures, uh, documents about I don't know how many exactly found in the region of the land of Palestine uh, around 60 years ago, and it had uh, many of those. I mean, it mostly had the Torah in it, and we find that it, it, it is exactly compatible with the Torah today. So how can I mean? I see this as a as a huge. Um, a blow for, for Islam because because Islam bases everything on the fact that the previous scriptures were, were altered, were changed. So but we, we see, I mean, these these the the, the two scrolls date two two thousand years ago. So I mean, we see that they're perfectly the exact same thing. Well, Nothing I, was changed. I, again, I would so challenge how, how would you you claiming what are you claiming is wrong? I would challenge that assumption again because there were there were uh, Christians called the Nazarenes who believed that Jesus did not die on the cross. So then how would you explain that before Islam? I mean, there were these there were these Christians that, that, that are 50 years or 100 years after uh, Jesus' death. There were Christians that didn't believe he died on the cross, didn't even believe that he was the Son of God. So then, what happens to the historical evidence that you're putting forward right now? It doesn't hold much weight, and this is pre-Islam. So it could one could argue that maybe Islam is congruent with the actual evidence that supports that he didn't die on the cross. But it's but Islam itself doesn't have the evidence. It just it just says one thing. It has a thesis, but it doesn't have any evidence for it. So it might as well be what you were saying. It might, it might not have died on the cross, but he might have died on the cross. Well, and it, we have yeah. the Bible has witnesses, so that's a that guarantee. Okay, well, but you're presupposing that they're legitimate witnesses, and that you're presupposing that those documents are legitimate documents to to in the Dead Sea Scrolls, man. Dead Sea Scrolls. Yeah, they're, they're perfectly compatible. No, no, you're missing, you're missing the point here. Just because something is authentic doesn't mean it's true. I could write something now and say that I'm the prophet of God, in 2,000 years from now someone could find that book. Does that mean I'm the prophet of God? But did not God write the real Torah? No, 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 no. no. But you're not saying that God wrote the Torah. You're, you're, conflating, you're, you're conflating authenticity with the book being 
being divine, the claim to divinity. Authenticity does not mean divinity. What was the first, what was the, if you remember his uh, speech in, the, in the, the first part, what did he say? That we cannot argue for authenticity, that the Quran is authentic. Because that does not logically follow that it's divine. You are arguing in a similar way. You're saying that this, Dead Sea Scrolls are authentic, and therefore it follows that it's divine, therefore it undermines the Qur'an. That is the full, full, that is false, because Muslims are arguing that if the books are, that the authentic Torah, the, 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 the authentic Bible, is the, word of the authentic Bible is the word of God. I'm not okay. saying that, the Muslims are saying that. Furthermore, also what I'd like to say is, uh, if you just look at the, uh, those two aspects, once, uh, what, obviously, if we just look at the, uh, the, the text referring to the crucifixion from the Quran and the Bible, then it does not mean anything. This is a cultural exchange. One does not mean that it's more powerful than the other in respect to his explanation. However, Islam doesn't just claim that it's the book of God. It doesn't just claim. We have seen arguments in this evening that support that the Quran is the word of God. When we establish that it's the word of God, then we take what the, the, the word of God says about that matter at hand. It's not the other way around. If we argue the other way around, then fair enough. It would be a, a pretty lame argument. But if we first establishing that the, the Quran is the word of God, that it's divine, that Muhammad peace be upon him was a messenger, then we take note of what it says, not the other way around. That's what I was saying. So the challenge is something. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm from Jordan. First of all, that's this scrolls. I was born near uh, Dead Sea. I'm talking to this guy actually. <laughs> <laughs> no, please, uh, please. Um, yeah. to, uh, uh, I was born near Dead Sea. Okay? And you, what you don't know is Israel and America kept the secret of the Dead Sea Scrolls. They kept most of them in the library of the Pentagon so that the world could not see them. So what you know about them is, is a, a very little thing. The, the, the major secret is not shown to us. So n neither Muslims or Christians or J Jews, uh, no, nobody knows about them. Okay? So uh, uh, Israel can hit them because they can reveal the, the secrets of uh, Israel. Okay. Thank you for sharing this information. And there was one more, one more question. Yes. Uh, about the Allah and Buhayr, Buhayr. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, why do Christians uh, deny uh, prophecies about Islam? Prophecies about uh, Muhammad? Well, the Prophet Muhammad is the So, if, if there is a Rahab called Buhayr, Buhayr, yes. Yeah. So, uh, why do they deny him? Now, uh, this is, uh, it's more complex than, than, than what we think. There are also, when Jesus Christ Muhammad came, Many and many Jews and Jewish scholars and let's say rabbis rejected him. You see, and we have just have seen uh, an example of that. So, and also it happens to many previous prophets and messengers. They would be always, if you want to say, uh, scholars of the previous dispensation <coughs> rejecting them, just to maintain their own welfare. If you want to say, now there are so many factors related to why was a certain people adhere to a certain faith which came before, uh, if you want to say, would uh, reject. And not, for example, believe in the, uh, can't say the latter message, and they believe that it was the final uh, message revealed to mankind. There are so many factors. Some of them is that maybe they didn't uh, have, they were not exposed to enough evidences. They are not convinced. Uh, maybe they don't. They are not aware of the prophecies. Let's say, uh, talking about the prophecies about the coming of uh, final prophet. Now, just to give a small example, as a person who studied comparative religion. If you look into the New Testament, for example, in the Gospel of John, chapter number 16, verse number 12, until verse number 16, we will find that Jesus, if you please be was telling his disciples, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Which means that there is still more to complete the religion, but you cannot bear them now. How be it, when he, the spirit of truth, will come, he will tell you uh, all about the truth, or the whole truth, the complete truth. For he shall not speak of his own, but whatsoever he shall hear, he shall speak. And he will tell you of things to come, and he will glorify me, etc. Now, of course, I've, I've, I've talked with uh, you know, a, a reverend, a Christian reverend, uh, 
about what does this verse mean. He said, well, it's the Holy Spirit. But the thing is, in that passage, it says, but he shall not speak of, uh, of his own. But whatsoever he shall hear, he shall speak. And the Holy Spirit is God. You know, God in, in, in Christianity, that is, God is a Trinity. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. So if uh, that Spirit mentioned in that text was the Holy Spirit, he would not have to rely on what he will receive from a superior uh, source. You see, and also the word spirit is identical to prophet in the Bible itself, in the first epistle of John, chapter number four. It's not the same as the Gospel of John, it's one of those epistles and uh, letters from Saint, in the uh, from Saint George, the end of the New Testament. You'll find that uh, the writer was saying, Beloved, in chapter number four, from the beginning, from verse number one, Beloved, believe not every spirit, for there are so many false prophets that came into this world. However, the spirit that confesses that, or confesses that uh, Jesus came in flesh, is of God. So this was the main criterion. If a spirit or a prophet or someone who claimed prophecy would admit that Jesus came in flesh, that Jesus came and he had his mission, etc., then this is a messenger of God. And of course, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, taught us to believe in Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, and to respect him, and to consider him one of the most important prophets, he and his mother, the best of all women. Uh, and I hope that this just gave an example about uh, the prophecy of pre previous scriptures and God knows best. Question on. Yeah. Yes. Uh, when you said that the uh, Quran, uh, unlike that the, uh, the other books, the uh, Islam claims that it was preserved yeah. and it wasn't altered in any way. Okay, I have I have two points to make on that. Okay. Uh, first, uh, what uh, and how can you explain, for example, the issue of uh, an nasr Okay, abrogation. Good. Yes. yes. Uh, I have Abrogation. Now, the, the abrogation also has existed in previous scriptures. If you have studied, uh, let's say, the Old Testament or the Torah, there was abrogation there. But what is the wisdom behind abrogation? The wisdom behind it is that God would send, for example, or would uh, command a certain a certain law right, for people to adhere to. And then later on, you see, through the development of the society, he would command another law which unifies the previous law and replaces it. And that is better for it. It's either because the society was not, could not have handled the final form of law, because it was still developing, it was still in its early stages, and you can take, for example, uh, the banning of alcohol, or you see, alcoholic beverages uh, at that time. It could have been uh, banned from the beginning of the mission because people you know, drank more alcohol than water. They asked once an Arab at that time, we heard that you drink uh, wine more than water. He said, it's not true, I never drink water. You see, so abrogation happens for a certain uh, uh, wisdom, and some verses which were abrogated, are, abrogated were still are still in the Quran to demonstrate the wisdom of going from one stage into another in legislation. The wisdom of Allah Subhanahu and His mercy upon His people, because if you were to spontaneously introduce a certain law during the development of the Islamic society, this would have worked, and Allah knows best. Do you have any other? Uh, my second point is, yeah. first, I want to ask you, what is the first mosque in Islam? The first mosque of Islam, I think it's the mosque which is called now uh, Masjid al-Qiblatayn, the Masjid of two uh, Qiblas, in which uh, the command of uh, changing the Qibla or direction of prayer from Jerusalem to Mecca was uh, was ordered. And then the Masjid of Inona in Medina, I think it is the second one. Yes. Uh, then how can you explain, for example... Mean, sorry, do you mean the, the first message during the mission of the Prophet or in the history of mankind? In the history of mankind. In the history of mankind, it was the Kaaba. The Kaaba was the first message, the first house of prayer, place of prayer established on this earth. And the second one was Al-Aqsa in Al-Quds in Jerusalem. But wasn't Al-Aqsa established uh, when the, uh, in the, uh, when the Amawiyin were... Uh, now that was the Dome of the Rock, but that message, that place was a message during the time of the, uh, was the people of Israel, the previous prophets and the messengers, and it was built way before that, it went through many stages, like for example the Kaaba. The Kaaba, due to many factors, for example, was abandoned and rebuilt, for example, uh, you know, Abraham, Ibrahim, Salam, the prophet, raised its foundation after it was, you know, almost demolished, and he rebuilt it and he left his wife and his son Ishmael, uh, Ismail alayhi salam, to establish a community there. And this is how it was people and the community went out. It's a long story. It